Welcome to Calvary Cerritos. Awesome. Tell you what, do me a favor if you don't mind, it won't just for the first song and during this time of prayer. Can I get you to stand with me? We're gonna open up in a word of prayer. Let's do that. Do that. Thanks for just a glorious day that uh, we just acknowledge that wasn't even promised to us, and yet here we are, we stand before you, a people eager to hear from you. We trust you, Lord, by your spirit that you would minister to us not only as, as a congregation collectively, but that you would also minister to us individually in our hearts and speak to us to the to situations that are going on, circumstances that happen to be going on in our lives. We just trust you to speak to us. We ask that uh, your message would be delivered with power from on high, and we just trust you with that. But now we want to respond to you in all your goodness and all that you've allotted, all that you've done, and all that you've seen in our lives. Lord, we want to respond to you for your goodness and all that you've done in your provision in this time of worship, that we would adore you and that we would worship in spirit and truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and everybody said... Dark tried to hide you, steer you away. And 
death tried to keep you inside of the grave. The enemy fought you, tried but he lost. You cannot be stopped. Cried for freedom, he tore down the walls. The weight of our burdens carried it all. Our fears and our failures hang dead on the ground. Not be stopped. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah. The battle is won. Nothing can stand against us. Stand on your victory, shout out your praise. Miracle maker, you're mighty to see. Awesome in power, let this in love. Cannot be stopped. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah. The battle is won. Nothing can stand against us. Nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. There's nothing. There is nothing that can stop our God. stop our God. There is nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah. The battle can't stand against our God. Let's sing this last part together. We're going to take this song right out. There is nothing that can stop our God. And there is nothing that can stop our God. And there is nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing, last time, there is nothing. There is nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing that can stop our God. And there is nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing.
Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? that you could see it for me we do it's all creation groaning it is there's a new creation coming it is there's a glory of the Lord to be the light Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah. Who conquered the grave? He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of our blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And is Jesus our Messiah forever those he loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? All right, good. Well, good worship. Thank you, Greg, very much. And a couple quick announcements. So uh, next week is 4th of July. So we're going to be doing, I think, a fellowship in the park next week. Um, so it'll be at noon. It'll get going to be at Liberty Park, um, where we did 4th of July last year. So it's going to be a little bit different. We're not going to barbecue and do three-legged races because it's hard to do that with six feet of distance. Um, so we're just going to kind of just everybody bring their own meal um, among their family, and we get to sit out and a fellowship to whatever anybody's comfortable with. 
Um, and so we'll be hanging out at the park there, maybe do a little worship, a little devotion. So we'll be doing that, trying to maybe think of activities. If you guys have an idea, something you could do without touching people, uh, then maybe we could do some activities that way and have some fun. So let's go ahead and pray. Is there anything else? Oh, marriage ministry is usually on the first Friday of the month, but because it's the 4th of July weekend, we're going to, like last month, we're just going to push it an extra week. So it's going to be the second Friday of July. And so that's going to be not this Friday, but the following. So mark that. As usual, uh, prayer is going to be this Wednesday. And our men's study, we're in the book of Nehemiah. So any guys that want to join us, we're in chapter 3 and 4 this week. Um, and so we'll be covering that. So I think that's it. Did I forget anything? Yes. Oh, the ladies. Yes. You want to share? No, you share. <laughs> so the ladies uh, study. So there's going to be a ladies uh, study and painting uh, event here uh, on July 18th. Okay, so it's going to be in about at 10 a.m. Uh, and so that's going to be in a few weeks. So if you guys, it's going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning before service. So any of the ladies come out, you can go on our website, check out the painting and some of the details about that. And um, uh, the guest speaker is Julia Damo, uh, world-renowned Julia Damo is going to be here. And so uh, that'll be at 10 o'clock. And I think we're going to have pre or previously wrapped and sealed pastries. Uh, if you guys want to bring your own, there'll be coffee here. So anyway, um, that'll be a good time. Yeah, Twinkies and Ding Dongs. So Eric and Twinkies are going to be here. No, I'm just <laughs> So, all right, well, let's have a word of prayer, and then let's get into uh, Matthew chapter 17. So, Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and love. We thank you for just our time to be in your presence, Lord. We thank you for uh, this time, Lord, to get into your word. So, we need you, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you would reveal yourself, that you would teach through me, that you would put your words in my mouth that, Lord, you would breathe life into them by your spirit, that you would give each of us understanding to, to hear what you're saying to each of us as you apply it in our lives. So we just commit this time to you now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How's the volume on there, Scott? Okay. All right, cool. All right, so we are picking up in Matthew chapter 17. We saw the Mount of Transfiguration last week, and so this week we're picking up in verse 9. And we're going to be seeing here Peter, James, and John, and Jesus coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And so we saw last week that the Mount of Transfiguration was really for the three disciples. To add to the revelation that was given in chapter 16, which Peter declared that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so now we have not only did Jesus show himself in his true form, um, but he also had Moses and Elijah that appeared with Jesus, and the Father descend in the cloud of glory, like the Shekinah glory of God, on the scene and verbally speak and declare that Jesus was his son, and to listen to him. So he's, he kind of replaced, superseded the law and the prophets as what Moses and Elijah pointed to. So it was intended to strengthen the faith of the three disciples that were up there. That was its purpose. As we're going to see by the end of the chapter, that these, these events all happened about a month before the crucifixion. And so they were about to see something that would probably shake their faith. And so he showed them this as a glimpse of hope of the resurrection and what would happen after the crucifixion. And so that's the purpose behind it. And so we saw Peter um, speaks out of place, equates Jesus with Moses and Elijah and the Father. That's when he descends and says, listen to Jesus because he supersedes them. Uh, that, now in verse 9 it says, Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Now we've seen this before, chapter 16, when the disciples declared Jesus as the Messiah, as Christ, the Son of the living God. He tells them to tell no one. But now he's telling the three not to tell anyone, even the other nine disciples that weren't there, until, though, he gives them a time frame, until... The, the resurrection, he says. And so why is that? Well, just like throughout Matthew, we've seen multiple times Jesus is always trying to control the timing. 
If word got out too soon of who he was, crowds would build, the fervor would build, the excitement, and it would push him to the cross before it's time. Um, hostility the same way. Whenever hostility was building up too much, he wasn't afraid of it, but he diverted it because he didn't want to push the cross until it was time, until the Passover. And so here he's managing that. Plus, it might add confusion. The disciples who walked with Jesus for three years, they had a hard time understanding all this, understanding his, his death and his resurrection and his revealed glory. How much more would the large crowds, hearing of his, his glorified presence, and then hearing about the crucifixion and seeing it would really confuse them. And so he says, just hold on to that. It's for your guys' faith. Hold on to that until after the resurrection. And I, I just thought, too, it, sometimes in our life, we get something from the Lord. And we're not to go spouting off sometimes to everybody everything we get. Uh, a lot of times we get something from the Lord, and that's just for us for a season. And we're to hold on to it until the time the Lord says, perhaps, to share it, if ever, with anyone else. And so that's the dynamic and the sweetness of our relationship with the Lord. Sometimes he gives a word just for us for a time, and we just hold on to that until he tells us otherwise. Uh, but verse 10, then they move on, and his disciples ask him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And what an interesting question, really. They just came from the Mount of Transfiguration, seeing Jesus glorified, hearing the voice of the Father, and they, they seemingly to us an obscure statement like, so why is Elijah coming first? Like, why did that, where did that come from? That seems, I'd have a million other questions before I'd ask that question. But to them, it seems like they're reconciling, they're processing all the events from the last two chapters, because they've happened rather quickly for them, and major revelations have come in these last two chapters. And so they're processing all this. The very last two verses in the Old Testament are in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. You don't have to turn there. I can read them to you, but they're about Elijah. And these are the last words of God for 400 years. And so you could see why this was a big understanding about Elijah. It says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the father. He's going to be, bring nati national revival and repentance, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So the scribes, they were expecting the Messiah, and they expected the Messiah to do a few things. One, to bring the day of the Lord. It's worded different ways, but it's talking about the final judgment on the planet Earth. This great and terrible day of the Lord. And so this day of the Lord would be a day of judgment and the establishment of God's kingdom on Earth. And they were expecting that. They were waiting for that. But before that, based on this verse, they were expecting Elijah to come before the Messiah, to prepare the way, to turn the hearts of the people back to the, or back to God and to the Messiah. So as the, as the disciples are coming down now, they seem to be processing this, especially after seeing Elijah. And they're like, hey, wait a minute. I just remembered Elijah's supposed to come first, but you came first. And now we saw Elijah on the mountain. Is that the revelation that Malachi was talking about? And then you said you weren't coming to establish your kingdom, but you're going to die and raise from the dead. What's all this mean? And it seems that they're processing this. And so Jesus responds in verse 11 through 13. He says, Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. So he confirms, hey, the scribes have it right. This is going to happen. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. So we see as Jesus responds, now in the previous verses, Jesus has been very blunt with his interactions with the disciples. And he's called them out many times about their lack of faith, their lack of understanding. And in, in chapter 16, he was a little bit hard on them because they didn't understand what he expected them to understand at this stage in their relationship with him and following him. And so he was very open with his rebuke and correction of them. But here he doesn't answer that way. He's not harsh with them. He's not saying you should understand this or oh, you have little faith. He kind of says, hey, good question. You guys are starting to catch on here and you're starting to reconcile some things. And so he responds with an honest answer with no tone of correction in it. So in verse 11, again, he confirms that Elijah will come back before 
the great and terrible day of the Lord. But this isn't it. This isn't that day. This isn't the day of the Lord. This is his first coming. And what many didn't understand was the two comings of Christ. The first to die for the sins of the world. The second to come in judgment and establish his kingdom on the earth. We talked about that many times. If he didn't come the first time, the, the second coming would be empty, right? His kingdom would be established regardless, but no one would qualify for entrance. And so he had to come to die for our sins so that we would be able to enter this kingdom and enjoy his second coming. Otherwise, we'd all fall under his wrath and judgment. So the first time he came as the lamb, the second as the lion. Most likely, Elijah will come before that final day of judgment. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the two witnesses that will come and turn the hearts of Israel back to God. And so most believe that one of those two witnesses is Elijah. So literally, Elijah will come. But Jesus says here in verse 12, he's also come back in another sense. The work that Elijah came to do, that spirit and power of Elijah came on someone else before his first coming, and that was John the Baptist. And so the scriptures are pretty clear leading up to this point that, that, Eli that uh, John the Baptist did come and do the work of Elijah, the same kind of ministry. In Luke 1.17, it says that John the Baptist ministered in the spirit and the power of Elijah. In Matthew chapter 3, earlier on, we saw the physical appearance of John the Baptist was just like that of Elijah the prophet, how he clothed himself, his diet of locusts and honey. That's what Elijah looked like and ate. Matthew chapter 11, a few verses earlier, Jesus said as much. He says, John is Elijah. He came in to do the ministry of Elijah. Why? Because he brought the, the message of repentance to God. The true meaning of the law. He confronted the religious leaders and he set the true heart behind the law and the Old Testament the way God intended it to be. So he came to bring national restoration through repentance of heart to prepare the people for the coming Messiah. So he did come in that sense to do the work and ministry of Elijah, and the disciples understood it by verse 13. It says, oh, he's talking about John. So, so far, so good. Before, the disciples probably would have went over their head, but we see, too, this theme through this chapter, this, this revelation uh, that they saw of Jesus kind of put them in tune and proximity to God where they had a better sense of discernment. We're going to see this in contrast now when they come down and experience the other nine apostles that didn't go up and how they were faithless and perverse. And so what a stark difference that is. And we're going to kind of look that through the next few verses here. So verses 14 to 18. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him kneeling down, uh, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation. Kind of hard words. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And so <clears throat> this is written in Mark and Luke as well. And Mark and Luke give a lot more details about this episode than Matthew does. And they're kind of written from two different perspectives. And this harsh word in verse 17, I've always, always wondered when I read this verse, who is that directed to? You perverse, you faithless and perverse generation. Is it to the disciples? Was it to the Father? Was it to the crowds? Because he's had similar things before in Matthew we've read. He's kind of rebuked this generation. It seems to be a very hard and faithless generation. He's called them wicked and perverse on many occasions, unbelieving and perverse. So we've said that overall there some, seems to be something unique about this generation that Christ came to that was very dark and unbelieving. Jesus even said, hey, if Sodom and Gomorrah had what you had, they would have repented. They repented at a lesser prophet, Jonah, than you have before you, and you're still not repenting. And so I think there's a lot of blame to go around in this verse, but it's interesting how the different Gospels seem to have a different perspective of who this was worded to. In Mark, it seems to be more directed at the Father, and not necessarily like harsh to him, but it's all, all three Gospels use this episode 
to talk about faith and the need to believe and a rebuke against unbelief. And so in Mark, it kind of draws out the faith of the Father. If, if you've ever read it, there's this kind of cool dialogue that Jesus had. The, the Father comes and meets Jesus and says, Hey, I came for you, Jesus, but you weren't around, so I, I asked your disciples to help. And your disciples couldn't help me. They were unable to. But it's clear, it seems to be from Mark and Luke, right up the get-go, it's not epilepsy, it's demon possession. And we'll talk about that word in just a moment, that they understood that this was a demonic influence here. The boy was thrown down in front of Jesus and started to convulse right before him. And it always gives me a chuckle, because then Jesus kind of has this casual dialogue. The guy's like on the ground in, in a seizure, and Jesus is like, so how long has this been going on? <laughs> he kind of talks to the father real casually, and the father's like, hey, if there's, if, if there's anything you could do, please do it. And Jesus goes back and says, if you can believe, kind of poses the question back. If there's anything I can do, well, if, if you can believe, anything's possible, he said. And we'll, we'll look at that in a moment as well. And it draws out this great declaration from this man that I've prayed many times before. He says, I do believe, but help my unbelief. And so this exchange in Mark's account seems to be more directed at the father to draw out his faith, show the lack thereof, and build it up, and, and bring up this declaration. But here in Matthew, it's written from a little bit different perspective. The father's not the primary audience and in interaction. Remember, Matthew wrote this. Not you, Matthew. But Matthew, the apostle, wrote this. My nephew Matthew's here. For those of you on camera, I'm just kidding. And so Matthew wrote this, and he was one of the nine that couldn't heal the guy. He was one of the nine left behind that, that was incapable of uh, exercising this demon. And it seems that he feels that that statement, you faithless and perverse generation, was directed towards the nine. And that's kind of the reading here as we go through. Again, this, this term, this generation, I think can apply to the father, to the religious leaders, to the crowds, to the disciples, because there was plenty of it. But we're going to look at it from Matthew's perspective, which was these disciples. So the scene here in Matthew is, again, they're returning from the mountain. Perhaps they were gone for a few days. If, if we talked about this is most likely called Mount Heron, which was about 4,000 feet above sea level, it would have been quite a hike for the three to go or four to go up. And they probably hiked up for a few days. Perhaps, I don't know how long they were there and came back. They could have been gone multiple days before they returned here. And so, again, all this started to transpire. This man came to see Jesus. He wasn't around. He heard about the great power, the miracle workings, the freedom and liberation and healing that Jesus brought. And so he came to see if he could heal his son. But he wasn't available. So he asked his disciples, can you help? He calls it epilepsy, but in the Greek... This isn't the word that we would typically use for epilepsy. They were familiar with epilepsy. So a lot of people think like, oh, they just called everything demon possession. A guy was epileptic. A guy had this, and they just called it demon possession. We're, we're now we're advanced, and we know it's epilepsy. No, they knew it was demon possession. And this word means moonstruck. It's a unique word that, that, that's saying this guy's struck. Oh, he's mad. He's a lunatic. That's where the word lunatic comes from, is moonstruck. Uh, and so he's a lunatic. But they seem to know it's demonic. Again, as you, especially you read Luke and Mark up front that that's what it is. So here we have a strong contrast between the mountain of transfiguration and the valley of demon possession. Right On the mountain of transfiguration, we see the revealed glory of God. And then they come down to the demon-possessed valley. Right, We're confronted with Satan and a, a seemingly strong presence opposing them. On the mountain, the Father declared the Son... Uh, and, and revealed the glory of the Son. On the, in the valley, the Father pleaded for liberation for his demon-possessed Son. And so both fathers interacting or speaking on behalf of their sons, but two totally different possessions. Positions, not possessions. So we see Jesus' statement here, again, verse 17, pretty harsh. He said this before, again, uh, to this generation. But these words, faithless and perverse. Faithless means Lacking in faith or unfaithful. It could be either way. But perverse means turning aside. So the disciples lacked faith, trust in God, and they had already turned aside from, in some form or fashion, from Jesus or their reliance upon him. So why was Jesus saying this? Well, for a few reasons. One, remember 
that Jesus had already given them the ability to cast out demons. In chapter 10 of Matthew, verse 1, this is where he commissions. He gives them authority and power specifically over demons, and he sends them out to heal, do miracles, and cast out demons. Jesus was about one month away from his crucifixion. He was about to depart. And so much like chapter 16, a few days earlier, when he gave them that word, if you remember, they're crossing over, and he said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes. And they're like, what? Like, we, oh, because we forgot bread. They're talking about lunch. They're totally off the subject. And Jesus lays into him and says, oh, you guys have little faith. You lack understanding. You shouldn't be there at this point. Your head's not in the game. I'm about to leave. The whole church is riding on you understanding what I'm saying. If you can't do that while I'm here before you, how much more is it going to be when I'm away communicating by my spirit? You know, you guys got to kind of get in the game here. Pay attention. And I love how he walks them through. He doesn't tell them the answer. He tells them where their head and their thinking should have been. And then he just restates his statement, and then they get it. So he gives them a real object lesson of how they're supposed to stay engaged with him to have good understanding. So now here Jesus goes up to the mountain for a few days. These guys lose faith. They lose their focus. And it's, it's almost like he's saying, really, guys? Right? I'm about to leave for good in a month, and you guys fall apart. I've been gone a few days. It's like it, it, there's, there's this level of frustration with them that he expected them, and they were supposed to be somewhere different than they were. So there's a breakdown here that we're going to see in just a moment that I think they're going to learn of why they failed. So verse 18, Jesus rebukes the demon. It comes out, and he heals and cures that very moment, this boy. So now let's move on to these disciples, how they respond. I think they come in humiliation now, exposed before all the crowd as being incapable of, of doing what they thought maybe were overconfident they were able to do. So verse 19, it says, Then the, the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will have said to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. And so the disciples, again, coming in defeat, humiliation, coming privately, right? They were humiliated publicly. Now they're trying to figure out, why couldn't we do this? Jesus says the problem is the unbelief. And he says the cure is fasting and prayer. We're going to see as we develop here, fasting and prayer is the answer to being faithless and perverse. And so we'll see how that works. Now, they failed, most likely, for one of two reasons. And both were because of a self-focus, a self-reliance. They were focused on what they could or couldn't do instead of the authority that God had already given to them. They could have failed because, again, they were acting in self-confidence instead of reliance upon the Lord. They were given the power in chapter 10. They had moved and manifested that before, and now they moved as a matter of custom, a matter of habit, assuming it was there without truly seeking the Lord. At the end here, this exhortation for prayer and fasting seems to imply that they failed to pray and seek God, period, for the ability to cast this demon out. The other way perhaps they might have failed was that they had no confidence. Because Jesus wasn't present, they felt that they couldn't do it. Even though Jesus had already given them the authority, but because he wasn't physically there, they lacked faith to have the confidence in the authority that he'd already given to them. Either way, the answer to both of those is to pray and fast. Either side is self-reliance on two ways. They either were self-confident or self-impotent. They were incapable of exercising the power and authority that God had already given them. They were focused on what they could or couldn't do. That's the problem. Their focus was on them. They were either self-reliant and overconfident and not relying on the Lord, or they looked at themselves and said, I, we can't do it. Jesus isn't here. They were reliant upon themselves, and they saw their own insufficiencies, and so they couldn't exercise the faith and authority that God had already given to them. Either way, again, prayer and fasting is the solution. Prayer and fasting shows a heart that's set on seeking and depending upon the Lord. Understanding his power is sufficient. It takes the focus off of us, 
our sufficiency or lack thereof, and it puts it on the Lord. And so that's why there's the exhortation to fast and pray. From their perspective, they had just seen this lived out in the life of Jesus. Not only did he teach them this, but he saw them live this out, right? Jesus had left them to go to the mountain to pray. And we don't know, but there's a really good chance they didn't take food. Much like Moses, when he went on the mountain to seek the Lord, he fasted the whole 40 days he was on the mountain. And so this is very representative of that interaction with the Shekinah glory of God and everything that happened up there. So it's very likely that he went up to, to be in the presence of the Lord. They knew that. He brought the other three disciples with him, and they brought no food, and they were gone multiple days on the mountain and spending time with God. And so fasting and praying as he was gone. Now he returns with closeness in their eyes to, their, to his father, and he immediately does what they're incapable of doing. So not only does he teach them the need to fast and pray in order to exercise the faith and reliance upon God, but he showed them what it looked like by spending time with the father and coming back with authority to cast out the demon, which they couldn't do. Now you look at this, and I think the same is true from us, as we're all called to do something. Whatever God calls us to do, it has to be met with reliance upon the Lord and dependency upon him. Otherwise, it'll fail in some way. We fail on one of these two sides as well, again, on self-reliance. We can look at ourselves, and we can think we can do it. We could be operating off of our own experience, our know-how, our abilities, and fail to be reliant upon the Lord and draw on his power. If we do that, we might move things in the material, temporal world, but we'll never touch anyone spiritually or eternally. And so we might see movement. We're capable of that on our own abilities. We can move things in the material world, but we'll never touch anyone's spirit, anyone's soul, anyone's heart for God. And so we need that reliance upon him. Or we could be the other way. We could be focused on ourselves and our own inabilities, and we can't do anything for the Lord, right? And so our faith is weak in the authority and abilities that God has given to us. We're, again, aware of our lack of ability to do anything or experience in that thing. The answer to these, again, for us to fast and to pray. Understand what he's called us to do and understand his strength and ability to do whatever he's called us to do. That's why he says, in that context, you can do whatever you want, right? Uh, you will always have the ability. What's he say here? Um, if you have enough faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move, uh, and it will move, for nothing will be impossible. Anytime that's worded in this context, as well as like Philippians 14 or 4.13, which says all things are possible, we can do anything, it's always in the context of moving in the will of God by his authority. It's not like I'm a superhero or I have magic powers. If I have enough faith, I can literally move a mountain, you know, and make it move or a building or anything weird like that. It's, it's, it's a figure of speech showing that if I'm working in God's will and relying upon his authority, then whatever he wants to do can be done. And so that's the context where all things are possible. A last thought before we close out this chapter is many people look at this and say, what a bummer, right? Typical Satan. One moment you have a mountaintop experience seeing the glory of God. The next, Satan's there to reign on the parade. Right after the glorious revelation, we have the enemy that's trying to ruin it. And maybe you think that in your own life. Man, I've, had, I've gone to retreats a lot of times. Every time I go away, have some sweet time with the Lord, I come back and there's drama. There's spiritual warfare. The enemy's attacking. Uh, what a bummer. But I'd say to you, what better time to encounter the enemy than after a mountaintop experience, after the revelation of God? The enemy's always out there. Many times we don't discern it because we're not close to the Lord. We haven't had a mountaintop experience, so we're kind of blind to the enemy. We're, we're much more sensitive to the enemy, his presence and influence when we're close to the Lord. And so usually we're more sensitive to the spiritual warfare when he comes down. Our purpose isn't to have an easy life. It's to have a life that's influential in expanding God's kingdom. So that, by nature, means I'm coming against the kingdom of the enemy. So again, what better time than after I've seen the presence of the Lord? A true mountaintop experience, by the way, isn't literally a mountaintop. I don't have to wait for a retreat or a getaway once a year to do that. I could have a mountaintop experience in my devotional time every morning. 
at church, whenever I go to church. At any time, I can have a mountaintop experience, if you want to call it that. But it's important to identify what a true mountaintop experience is. A lot of people are, are, are seeking an emotional experience, but that's not a true mountaintop experience. It's much more. So a true encounter, a, a, pre, a revealing of the presence of the Lord will produce a few things. So a true mountaintop experience will have us know Jesus better. We will see him better. He will reveal himself and we'll have a better grasp of who he is. Then as a result of that, the second thing, our faith will be built. So a true mountaintop experience is where Jesus reveals himself and our faith is strengthened. We have a better idea of who God is and we're assured of his presence and power in our life. If all you seek or come away with from what a mountaintop experience might look like is emotions, then you're getting ripped off. That's just an experience. It's entertainment. It's not the Lord. When we come off that mountaintop experience as well, after seeing the Lord, our discernment is clear as well. So we'll be able to discern spiritual warfare better. So the revelation of God, strengthening of our faith, that's exactly when we want to encounter the enemy. And it's the antidote to being faithless and perverse. When I truly see the Lord, then I have faith and assurance, but I'll, I'm not perverse. I'm not turned away. I'm clear on who he is, and I'm reliant upon him. And so it's the antidote of faithless and perverseness, which is the source of their spiritual inability of the nine disciples. And so that's where we need to stay. And so when we look again at this time, we should often, as we, every day, as often as we can, can look to see that Jesus, that's the one thing I always pray in my devotional times when I go to church, when I listen to a Bible study, it's, Lord, just reveal yourself. Just show me who you are that I could know you better. Not, nothing else, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to do is fine, but I just want to see you better. And that should be our, our desire on a daily basis is that he would reveal himself to us. Anything else he wants to give us is cherry on top of that. And as we do see him, our faith is strengthened, and then we should look for the opportunities to combat the enemy, to liberate people from the bondage or the blindness that he's putting on their lives. Caps it off, right? That's, that's amen. That's the, the amen right there. <laughs> Verse 23, 22 and 23. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed in the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were extremely sorrowful. So Jesus continues to re give revelation, to explain to them uh, what's coming. They, seem, they either don't understand or they're grieved. They seem to be focusing just on the crucifixion and not the victory of the resurrection. And so every time he talks about his future, about going, being uh, opposed, dying, and, and uh, raising from the dead, they stop at he will die. Right? They don't hear that last statement of raising from the dead. Verse 24 through 27, and we'll close here. When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From who do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, From strangers. And Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, and that's, I think, the thing that stuck out to me the most. Jesus says, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, take the fish that comes up first, and when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them from me and you. So again, a miracle that's worked out. Now, what a cool thing that is uh, that Peter must have experienced. A humbling thing, too, by the way, a side note. He was used to casting nets. He never fished with a line. That was extremely humbling <laughs> for an ex-fisherman to be out there with a little line. He was probably out there in a form of humility, like, I hope my friends don't see me out here, because those were his old fishing grounds. But again, humbling himself so he could experience a miracle from the Lord. And it was just for him. Nobody else probably ever knew about it. But he just saw the provision of the Lord. As he humbled himself, he saw God's provision that no doubt, as he got older, and in leading the church, 
he would always remember that, like, God can, can provide any way he wants. I've seen him do crazy stuff. Man, and one time I threw a line in and pulled it out, and I pulled the tax out. Um, God can take care of anything. And so, again, through humility, though, he saw the miracle of the Lord. But what was the temple tax? And so, for at Jesus' day, it was a relatively new implementation. It was for Jewish people. It was a sign of patriotism, and it was to support uh, the operations of the temple. Most of its, most believe it came from the origins of Exodus, when there was a tax on the people to provide for the tabernacle and its uh, implements uh, that was collected. And so this was a controversial tax. Uh, the Pharisees pushed it. They believed in it. The Sadducees rebelled because they were opposed to the Pharisees, so they didn't participate. Uh, the 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 the, the um, Guys at Qumran, they did it once in their life. They didn't pay annually like the rest of the nation of Israel and the men did. So this was an interesting tax, but it went to pay for the operation of the temple. And I found this interesting, and this is the point Jesus is making here. It's, why are you asking me? Why did you say I would pay the tax? Don't you remember who I am? Right? The temple was built for me, and now you want me to pay for it. That, that's rude, right? I thought of that like, like if, if you asked me to come uh, to go out to dinner and to eat, and I'd be like, well, you know what? I'm trying to watch my money. I uh, don't have a lot. And you would say like, you know what? Don't worry about it. Just come over to my house. I'm going to cook you a good meal. Oh, well. I, he, and you would say, I just want to hang out with you. Just want to spend time with you and fellowship with you. Okay, cool. So you come over, have a great night, eat dinner, fellowship, have a great time together. And at the end of the day, you say to me, oh, by the way, that's 20 bucks for the meal. I'd be like, what? You know, that's just rude, right? And I could stand and say, like, hey, no, right? I'm not going to pay you anything. I told you I didn't want to, I didn't have money or I didn't want to spend money. And, and you knew that and you brought me over and, and now you want to charge me, you know, to eat. And you're the one that wanted to have fellowship. Uh, and I can get offended and stand on those, those kind of rights to do that. But Jesus here, interesting, he's saying, like, I sh shouldn't have to pay. This is my temple here. Uh, you we built to worship me that we can commune, and now you want me to pay taxes? But Jesus lets it go. And there's a huge lesson, I think, for us here, so as not to offend, he says. And so that's a big point there. Jesus wasn't, didn't have a problem with offending people. Jesus offended people often. He would often take a stand on issues and seems like sometimes would even provoke conversations to make a point that would offend people some of the religious leaders. Chapter 15, verse 12, those are the exact words used. It says, after this interaction Jesus had with the religious leaders, his disciples came and said, do you not know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard you say this? Right? Jesus offended him. He didn't apologize. He didn't be like, oh, I'm sorry, that's not loving. He said, well, good. <laughs> he essentially responds and says, yeah, they, they have reason to be offended because they're in the wrong. Chapter 12 same thing. He has a harsh word for the religious leaders, the Pharisees. Remember, he's plucking uh, heads, him and his disciples of grain, and they said, you've broken the Sabbath law. And he goes, no, I haven't. I haven't broken my Sabbath law. I broke the traditions of men. And it, he brought these situations that he'd contend with them. He'd stand his ground because it was at the core of the problem. And that's the point here. These interactions where he would offend, where he would stand his ground, where he wouldn't compromise, were because they were the issues that were at the heart of the gospel and the purpose of his mission. They were the ones claiming what was righteous and not righteous, who was clean and unclean. They had put their traditions above the law and standard of God. It was at the very heart of what required repentance and the offering of the sacrifice he was about to make. So he stood his ground. He says, I'm not compromising. This is right and this is wrong. And so he took a stand for this, and that stand offended people. But here... He says no, because this is an area of personal preference. It's an area of personal rights. And he says, hey, I could stand and offend, but what good would it do? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to accomplish any kind of mission that I'm on here. It's not going to accomplish my will and the purpose of the Father. And so I'm going to let it go. I'll eat this one. But again, I'll show you. Do a miracle. Go, go fish. <laughs> Pull out a coin. It's not coming out of my pocket, right? Uh, I'm going to take it out of God's provision here. But a cool miracle. But a strong application for us as well. What do you stand for? What do you take a stand for? What are you open to be offend people over? That's an important thing. There's a lot of people taking stands these days. 
on a lot of different issues, right? From scripture and doctrine, politics, social issues, whether you wear a face, face mask or not, a lot of people are taking stands. And so we should and we will dig our feet in and take a stand for things we believe in and are committed to, right? But here's the flip side of that. What we take a stand for shows what we're committed to. It reveals our heart. And I think a lot of people's hearts and their beliefs and what they're committed to is being revealed through a lot of things that are going on today. As believers, we should care about the things that God cares for. And so we should be standing for God's will, God's righteousness, God's kingdom and his glory, right? Those are the things we should be standing for. And so there's a lot of things we can. It's not like if I stand for that, I can't stand for anything else. But that should be communicated. Anything I stand for should be communicated that God is my top priority. Some people stand for nothing, and it just shows a selfishness, right? I don't want the trouble. I don't want to rock the boat. And it's really self-preservation, so they take no stand on any issue. Other people have to make a hard stand over things that God says I want you to stand for. There are certain things in Scripture that God says, these are uncompromising. And so it, you, we have to take a stand for certain things, and it will offend certain people. But there's also people that I see that take a stand for things scripturally that Bi the Bible says, no, you don't have to divide. You don't have to b have division over that issue, right? You could debate. You could have an opinion. But when it comes to offending and drawing a line in separation, I don't call you to do that, especially with other believers. And so we have to understand what, what God wants us to stand what God will have us offend and separate from somebody, and what we're to relinquish and what we're to give up and not offend and cause a mark of division. Some people are showing by their stands, especially to Christians, the world is going to, they should take stands. Everybody's got to stand for something. But a lot of times in the world, it's misguided. They're, they want to hope in something. They want to trust and stand for something, and that's built into us. But it's supposed to be towards the Lord. That's our eternal destination. And so when we come to the Lord, we want to stand for his heart, his will, and his kingdom. And so as believers, that should be evident in any stand that we take, even if we offend other people. And again, I see believers separating from other believers over secondary issues that the Bible tells us not to do that. Uh, I see people separating over if they should wear a face mask or not, right? Having heated contention over, you're not wearing one, I'm going to wear one, I don't feel a need to wear one. It's like, I shouldn't separate over things like that. Have an opinion and have a passion, but don't separate over those things. And again, even on the social issues going on, social justices and stuff, in there, there's a lot of things that can be biblically grounded. But as a believer, I should know why I should stand for something. That's, I think, more important is not only what I'm standing for, but why I'm standing for that. And so there's a lot of principles and a lot of what's going on that are grounded in the righteousness of God, the equity of God, the justice of God. But is that what I'm standing for? And that should be coming out of how I stand as well. Again, a lot of people are, uh, I, I watch some uh, Christians and I could say, like, wow, they're more committed, I think, to politics than they are to Jesus, right? They're more committed to taking a stand on coronavirus than they are on pro proclaiming the gospel and who Jesus is. And so, but I also know of a lot of people that take positions on those, but you could also tell it's under the umbrella of their overall calling to glorify God, seek his will, and to see his kingdom expanded. And so there's a healthy balance with Christ as the priority as they dialogue and discuss all these issues. And so, again, we don't have to choose side. It just has to be all under the umbrella of who Jesus is. And the last word on that is, even if we're taking a stand on the right thing, we've sought the Lord, we see his will on a matter, we're standing for what God wants us to stand for, we have to stand the right way as well. Just because we stand for the right thing doesn't give us justification to do the wrong thing. And a lot of people uh, can sin in their passion for defending what they think is the right thing to stand for. And so we never have the right not to bear the fruit of the Spirit. We never have a right to sin and break the word of the Lord. And so we stand for what the Lord calls us to stand for, but it has to be done the right way as well. Christ stood for the most important things in eternity. 
He stood for eternal issues, calling sin for what it is, calling righteousness, uncleanliness, cleanliness. He took a stand and faced opposition to draw the line on eternal matters crystal clear. Uh, but he never sinned, right? He, he never used that excuse to start slapping people around, to yell and cuss at people, or to do things that were unbiblical. And the same thing, as if somebody were to come in here and start preaching heresy, I would be passionate I would be in the Lord to defend that and stand for truth, but I would be out of bounds the moment I started to sin in defending that position, right? If I, if I screamed or cussed or slapped the guy, right? Now I'm just as bad as the position I'm, uh, I'm trying to fight against. And so we have to do the right thing the right way. And so again, important thing, I think, with Jesus desiring to know or showing us really that line of when to offend, when to take a stand, and when not to take a stand particularly when it comes to issues of pre personal preference. The Bible is clear on that as well. When it comes to areas of preference, we give way, right? Uh, it says in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 that um, we're to submit one to another. Uh, and so it, in Philippians chapter 2, it says, consider one another as more important than yourself. So areas of preference, we shouldn't be demanding. We shouldn't be self-willed and demanding people. We should be those that are... Um, yielding in areas, again, of preference or opinion. And so, again, those are a lot of words that the Lord has, but again, an important thing for us, especially today on all the issues that people are taking stands for or not taking stands on anything. So we're going to have a time of communion as we close that, kind of a sudden, abrupt, what, we're over with? Yep, that's how it's going to end today. So we're going to do communion. So let's have a word of prayer. We sanitize the communion cups. We're not going to hand out the crackers and stuff. They're individually little wrapper things. So you guys could crack those open and uh, partake of communion. They don't have coronavirus on them or anything. And uh, so I'll pray. I'm going to hand those out. We're going to sing another song. And then I'll come up and lead us through a time of communion. So, Lord, we do thank you for your goodness, Lord. Uh, we thank you for your love. We thank you for our time to... Uh, get together, Lord, and gather. And right now, Lord, I pray um, that this is a time where you reveal yourself, that this is a time, God, of the Mount of Transfiguration, where we take a moment and slow down and meditate on who you are. I pray that you would reveal yourself through worship, reveal yourself through communion, that we would see you as we take of the elements, Lord, of your body and your blood, and that, Lord, from that, our faith would grow, that you would give us even a word for each of us individually, that you would give us a revelation of you that just we need. Even if it's supernatural, God, that you would just give us a vision, a true mountaintop experience to build our faith and to encourage us. So we thank you for your goodness. Prepare our hearts now as we, as we partake of communion, God. Again, as we remember, as we hold these elements, we remember what it means, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you loved us so much, God, that you gave yourself for us. And so, Lord, we're sinners. Our sin separates us from you. But, God, you died to reconcile, to forgive us and restore our relationship with you that we could commune with you as a loving father. So be here now, God, to speak, to reveal, to show your love and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, why don't we go ahead and stand, and I'll hand the elements out. We love your name. 
Lord, we love your name. Lord, we love your name. Lord, we love your name. Lord, we love your name. Your name. So, in 1 Corinthians, uh, we go to this verse often, but in chapter 11, Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, the body of Jesus uh, again, was broken for us. And so, again, we look at that individual pieces as Jesus was one body. He offered that body. And now we're individual pieces now that come together to form the new body of Christ. And he's our head, it says in Ephesians. And so uh, with that, we have a new purpose. We have a new family, a new community. We have a new leader in Jesus Christ, a uh, new unity. And so a lot come with the sacrifice of Christ and his broken body. And so as we meditate and we're thankful for the Lord and the hope that he brings, uh, let's go ahead and take that. So, so unwrap that top one. And then put it in your mouth without touching your hand. <laughs> so let's put it in our mouth. As we offer it to the Lord, we thank you for your goodness, Lord. We thank you for your broken body, Lord. We thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for being our head. We thank you for the body, Lord. And even those that are here, those that aren't here, we're still the body of Christ. And so, Lord, I pray for those that are here as you unify us, you bring healing and protection through your body. And those that aren't here, that, Lord, we'd still be unified, that we'd still be in touch, we'd still be reaching out, that you'd bring unity among those that are here and aren't here because we're all your body still, Lord. We thank you that we have the ability to gather again, to partake in fellowship, and to worship you together. In Jesus' name, amen. And then the blood, it says here, the cup, in verse 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And so, um, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And so the, as we taste this, it's sweet. We remember uh, the sacrifice of Christ, but what it represents. And just think of that for a moment. None of us are perfect. All of us have sinned. All of us continue to sin. 
And so we are in constant need of that forgiveness of the Lord. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. He's a very patient and loving God and Father. And so the areas that we fail, the areas that we have questions, uh, anything, we can come to him. He's, he's made this possible to be very approachable, that we can come boldly into his presence and obtain mercy and grace at any moment. And so as we meditate on those things and take advantage of it. So let's pray, and then we'll partake of the juice. So, Lord, again, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your shed blood. We thank you for what it represents in our forgiveness and our restoration, uh, in bringing us into fellowship with you and allowing us to come into your presence at any time, to call you Father, to pray at any moment, to ask for forgiveness and know that your justice will forgive us because it's paid for. So, Lord, I pray that as we partake, any, anybody walking around with condemnation, that, Lord, they would, they would just understand your forgiveness in the blood. They'd be washed in forgiveness, Lord. Anyone struggling with sin that they know they need to get let go of and repent of, that as they partake of this blood that forgave them, it's the blood of love as well that will compel them to let go, that they'll see the power that comes to the blood to repent, that they'd be set free from anything that holds them, Lord. And Lord, your blood as well represents your love. And so, Lord, as we receive your love, we'd also love others. As we receive your forgiveness, we would be compelled to forgive others. So, Lord, I just pray that you would move and minister right now as we partake of the juice, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Lord, we thank you for your goodness and love. I pray you go before us this week, God. Give us protection. Give us safety. I pray, Lord, that we would examine the things we talked about today. That, Lord, we would... When was the last time we saw your glory? When was the last time we were in your presence? If it's been a while, God, I pray that we wouldn't be satisfied with that. That we would take time and spend with you and pursue you till we see you through your word, by your spirit, in, in prayer, Lord. As a result of that as well, Lord, that our, our faith will be strengthened, our eyes will be opened, and we'll then see the, the, the bondage, the presence of Satan that's already there, but we're not seeing, that we would be used by you to operate in your authority to set those people free and to bring healing to their life. Lord, I also pray that we would examine the things we stand for and how we stand for those things. Because, again, we stand for what we believe in, but what we believe in will be revealed by what we stand for. So let us take account, Lord. Are we self-willed? Are we difficult? Are we standing, having to have things our way? Are we dividing and taking stands and offending people over things we shouldn't? Are we standing for the right things that are grounded in your will and your glory and your word, but we're standing the wrong way? Show us, Lord. Are we truly concerned with you? your glory, your will, or us, or politics, or other things. Show us what our top priority is, God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.